All right. So first up, I'm looking at this uh, five choose two, and this is just a formula. I want to see whether you've memorized the formula, whether you haven't. So the formula we know is that it's going to be five factorial divided by two factorial divided by five minus two factorial. So that's the formula. N factorial over R factorial over N minus R factorial. And then if I multiply this out, this is going to be five times four times three times two times one on the top, on the bottom, two times one, and then three times two times one. So all of this portion cancels, the three, two, one cancels. Uh, the two and the four cancels leads with a two, and that looks like a five times two, so I just get a ten. All right, lovely. Okay, next up, how many ways to reorder the letters in the word Cincinnati? So this is a review. We've seen this kind of problem a couple times. And the idea here is I figure out how many ways can I slot in one of the letters, how many different ways can I slot in the next letter, and so on down the line. So let's do C first. I know that there's two different Cs. I'm also going to count that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different letters here. So there's ten possible spots. So the way I'm going to think about this is that first I can figure out where is it the C's are going to go. There's ten possible spots. There's two C's. And now I filled up two of the spots somewhere in this long list. Okay, that's good. Uh, next up, I'm going to fill out the I's. And I see that there's one, two, three different I's in Cincinnati. But I've used up two of my ten spots. There's only eight spots left. And i got to fit, fit three I's in those eight spots. So I'm going to have my eight spots remaining. I'm going to put my three I's in, and there it goes like that. Okay, next up, N. One, two, three different N's. So I've already used up five spots total, the two C's and the three I's. So I've got five spots remaining. And then I have one, two, three N's remaining. So five, choose three. And then I believe there's only an A and there's only a T left. So there's two spots, and I have to choose one of them for the A. And you can write this last one down or not, whatever you like. There's one spot left for the T, and there's only one spot to put in there, so it's one, choose one, which is just one. Whatever you want to think about this. So I did this where I was choosing the C's first, where I was choosing the I's first, where I was choosing the N's, then the A's, and finally the T's. But if you wanted to do it in a different order, it, it might look a little bit different here, but it'd be the same thing. All right, wonderful. So next up. A coin is tossed 10 times and the result's going to be recorded. So how many total possible outcomes are there going to be? Well, in this case, there's two possibilities for every flip. It's either heads or it's tails. So I'm going to say that there's two, and then since there's 10 total flips, it's two times two times two times two times two all the way down in all the slots. So I think two to the power of 10. All right. How many of those outcomes have exactly five heads? Now, what I want you to notice is that this is sort of a binary thing. It's either heads or it's tails. So for example, if I know the locations of all the heads, then that immediately tells me the locations of all the tails because it's either heads or tails. So how many outcomes have exactly five heads? Well, I gotta think about how can I choose which of those 10 flips are going to have heads. And I'm, because there's five of them, I want to choose five possible spots where they're going to be heads, and the remaining five spots are all going to be tails. So in other words, what I'm saying is that there's, there's ten total flips, five of them are heads, and I get to choose which of those flips have the five heads. So it's ten, choose five. All right. How many outcomes have at least seven heads? So notice here there's a couple possibilities. There's seven heads, eight heads, nine heads, and ten heads. So it's a sum of four different things. It's the sum of how many ways can you, from 10 possible flips, can you choose seven? But then I gotta add, I gotta add uh, 10 choose eight, because that's how many have eight flips. 10 choose nine, that's how many have nine flips. And finally, 10 choose 10, which by the way is just one, that would be the one cup case where every single one of them's heads. So when I, I look at the keyword of at least, the at least tells me it's seven, eight, nine, or 10, and then so I have to do one computation for each of those and add it up. All right, so now if I wanna look at how many outcomes have at most two heads, this is sort of similar, the, the at most is similar to the at least, but it works on the other side. If it's at most two heads, it could be there's zero heads, could be there's one head, or could be there's two heads. So I'm gonna say 
10 choose 0, that's the one way that they're all tails. I could then add the, the 10 different ways, 10 choose 1 will be 10, the 10 different ways I could have only one head, and then I add the 10 choose two different ways that there could be two heads. So pay a lot of attention to, to whether you say it's exactly, in which case it's only the one, at least in case it's the one or higher, or at most, or in which case it's the one or lower. All right, moving on. Okay, so an instructor gives an exam and it's got 14 questions total. Students are choosing some subset of 10 to answer. I did a few of these types of exams back in the day. I, I, I wasn't real a fan of them, but at least they're a rich example for our probability. So how many different choices of 10 questions are there? So you got these 14 questions, students choose which of the 10 they want to have count for marks. So I think it's going to be the 10, oh, excuse me, I want to have the 14 possibilities, they are choosing 10 from that. So a lot of these questions are the same kind of like choose notation, but they're, they might be said in different ways. All right, next up. How many groups of 10 questions contain, oh, I gotta read beforehand. Suppose six questions require proof and eight questions do not require proof, all right? So how many groups of 10 questions contain four that require proof and six that do not? So I think the idea is that first of all, I'm going to choose which of my four require proof. I'll do that first. And then independently from that, I'm going to choose which of my six do not require proof. So first of all, there's six questions that require proof. I have to choose four of them. So I have to take the six and I'm choosing four of them. Now I got to be careful. I'm adding or multiplying. Well, the way we're doing this, this is kind of like the rearrangements of Cincinnati. It's an independent event. So I have the, the one event choosing the proof questions. And then I multiply that by the uh, next event, which is choosing the non-proof questions. So... Uh, then I have to choose six questions without proofs among the eight that don't have proofs. So I'm going to choose eight, choose six. So it's a product of these two things. Okay. All right. So now I have this question. How many groups of 10 questions contain at least one? There's that at least one again that require proof. But we have eight without proofs and six with proofs. So... Every single possible test, even if the students use eight of them without proofs, they're still going to have to do two with proofs. So how many groups contain at least one that require proof? This is going to be all of them. Every single possibility. So it's that original, the 14 choose 10, no matter what it is that they choose, it's always going to have at least one that's going to do proofs. Okay, fair enough. Now, the next one, though, is that contains at most three. If we think about the possibilities, so the worst case scenario is eight with no proof and then two with proof. That's a possibility. You could also have seven with no proof and three with the proof. And that would be the case they at most. And then there's, there's more like four proofs, but we're not considering that. So I think there's really just two cases, three proofs and two proofs. So the one which is two proofs, we're going to have a sum of two things, the, the sum of two proofs and the sum of, of three proofs. The one that's the two proofs, well, of the six proof questions, I choose two. And then I've used up two problems. And then so of my eight questions that are not proof, I have to use all eight of them. So eight, choose eight, kind of boring. And then the next one is of my six, I choose three proof ones. And of my eight non-proof, I have to choose seven. And, and both the two plus the eight or the three plus seven adds up to the ten. All right, wonderful. Moving right along. So suppose now the exam instructions specify that at most one of questions one and two may be included among the 10. So a different scenario, nothing to do with proofs or non-proofs. We're saying at most one of the questions one and two may be included among the 10. Two possibilities, zero of the first two included and then we got the remaining 10. Or one of the first two is included and then and we've got the remaining nine. So let's do the first one first. I'm going to have zero included of the first two. And then of the 12 remaining, there's 10 spots open. And so that's what it is, 12 times 10, where I've taken zero of the first two. If you want to, you could come in here and, and say of the two, you choose zero. Two choose zero, you could multiply it out because the zero factorial is just going to be equal to the value of one. 
Either way, that's the number of zeros. Zero questions from the first two. And now from the one of the first two, well, you choose the one. Two possibilities, you choose one for it. And then you now have also 12 remaining things you can choose. But you've used up one, so there's only nine remaining. Okay, and final one. Suppose the exam question specified that either both questions, one and two, are included, or neither is to be included. Kind of a, kind of a funny one. So two cases. The, the first case is when none of them are included. The second case is when both of them are included. Okay, so if none of them is included, we've done that before. That's going to be the 2 times 0, and then times of the 12, you have to choose 10. That's, that's the one case. And then the next case is of the 2, you choose both of them. 2 times 2, choose 2. And then of the 12 remaining, you only have 8 left to choose. Wow, oh, poker, wonderful. So, consider a standard deck of cards, 13 denominations, 4 suits per denomination. A hand of 5 cards does not care about the order. Okay, so that's good. This is something we had to, we had to sort of sidestep around uh, in the past. We don't care about order here, so does it matter if you've got, for example, uh, a pair? Does it matter whether they come in the first two slots, or the last two, or the middle? It doesn't matter where they come. So choose the... Use the choose formula to compute the total number of five, 52, five card hands. So a, we have 52 spots, 52 cards to choose from. And what we're doing is we're choosing five. So it's just 52 choose five. Uh, 13 times four is 52. So 52 choose five. Okay, so so now we've got uh, this, this question where we're trying to figure out what a full house is. Full house is three things of the same denomination and then two things of a of that are repeated of a different denomination so like 888 a6 or a6 a8 eight, 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 eight. it wouldn't matter three of the same denomination and, and then two of the same denomination so i'm gonna figure out how can i do this and my strategy is gonna be this i'm gonna pick these denominations first and after i pick the denominations i'm going to pick the suits for the denominations so, uh, first of all, I have 52, or excuse me, 13 possible denominations. I want to choose one for the triple, so I'm going to do 13 choose one, and that's going to be choosing the triple. So I'll write choose the, the triple, the denomination of the triple. And then I want to choose the denomination of the double. So now there's 12 denominations left, because the double and the triple can't be the same, and I have to choose one of those. So this is going to be choose the double. And maybe I'll write denominator or denomination on the bottom. Denomination. Because I'll do the suits the next. And then now that I've chosen those, I have to figure out what suits they're going to be. So if I look at the triple, well, there's four possible suits, but I have to choose three of them. So four choose three. And then for the double, I have four suits, but I'm only choosing two cards. So I have to choose two of those. So this is going to be the triple suit, and the final one's going to be the double suit. So the suit of the triple and the suit of the double. So it's just, again, a big product of these. You choose the denominations, you choose the suits for the denominations. Uh, all right, so next up we have, oh, three of a kind, wonderful. So again, we have the three eights. Uh, but but now we have the, the, the next th cards could be just anything at all. It doesn't really matter. So same story for the eights. I've got 13 denominations for those. I'm going to choose one of them to be the denomination of the triple. All right, next up I have to deal with these, these two extras. So I've got 12 possible denominations for them. And I have two cards that I want to choose. And notice that i got to be careful here. I don't want to do 12 choose 1 and then 11 choose 1 because that would be where order would matter. It would matter which of these I picked first. This is not the case. So do 12 choose 2. Uh, then i got to figure out the suits. i got to figure out the suits for the three of a kind. So again, there's four possibilities for the suits, and I choose three. Then i got to choose the possible suits for the first of these flip ones. So I've got four different suits. I choose one of them. And for the second of these extras, four possible suits. Choose one of them. So, uh, what do we got? We are making a, uh, we've got a company, we've got passwords, they must be 35 symbols long. That can't be right. I think I mean three to five <laughs> symbols long and composed of the 26 letters of the alphabet. How many passwords are possible if repetition is allowed? 
So in this question where I've got three to five, the, the key sort of uh, distinguishing characteristic is that I want to be able to add the number of cases where there's three and then the cases where there's four and the cases where there's five. So what I'm going to say is that if repetition is allowed, then the 26 can go in every slot. So what I'm going to say is it's 26 cubed. That's the number of ways that there's there's three password long ones, three little long passwords. And then it's 26 to the four. That's the number of ways where you have four symbol long passwords. And finally, 26 to the power of five. So that's with repetition here. Okay. And then... Uh, how many passwords contain no repeated symbols? So same story. Let's do three, four, and five, and we'll add them up together. But if it's repeats, though, we, we have to knock one out. So it's like 26 for the first spot, 25 for the third, for the next spot, and then uh, and then 24. So that's the ones with three. The ones with four are 26, 25, 24, 23. So we're using up one every time. And then for five, it's 26, 25, 24, 23 and finally 22 and yes it's perfectly valid to just write it out like this where you don't want to try to multiply it with that number it's just leave it as a big expression and then how many passwords have at least one repeated symbol so that's interesting i want to do it the other way around because because there's all these ones like at least one repeated symbol you have to be like well one repeated two repeated three repeated four and so on so what i want to do is all the passwords minus those that have no repeats at all and what you're going to be left with is the sum that have at least one repeat. So the total number of passwords was going to be the, the 26 cubed, the 26 to the fourth, and the 26 to the fifth. So that's the total number of passwords. And then from this, we're going to subtract off what we previously done. So what we previously done was how many have no repeats. So you know what? I don't even want to repeat it. I'm just going to <laughs> don't want to repeat the number of repeats. I'm going to take this whole thing here, and I'm going to fire it right back down there. And I've got the total minus the no repeats, and that's going to leave me with the sum number of repeats, which is exactly what this question asked for. And then we're done. Okay.